This is the story of White House Farm, where in 1985 a massacre took place, killing five members of the Bamba family. The Bambas were a well-off family living in a large farmhouse in Essex. Neville and June Bamba were 61 years old and had adopted their two children, Jeremy, 24, and Sheila, 28, because they were unable to have children of their own. At the time of the murders, Jeremy was living in a house owned by his father in the nearby village of Goldfinger. He worked on the farm. Sheila, his sister, had been married and had six-year-old twins, Daniel and Nicholas. She had a short career as a model, going by the name of Bambi, but she struggled with her mental health, having been hospitalised and diagnosed with schizophrenia. She had a very difficult relationship with her mother, who had strict religious views, and they clashed often. It was sometime in the night between the 6th and 7th of August 1985 that five members of one family were shot to death in a large farmhouse near Tolshan, Darcy, in Essex. 37 years on, the White House farm murders, as it became known, are just as shocking. Numerous books have been written about this case, and recently a TV drama brought it back into the forefront of the nation's minds. I was a teenager in 1985, and it always struck me as the British Amityville. A sole surviving member of a murdered family, Jeremy Bamber initially invited sympathy. This later gave way to horror, as he was charged and convicted of all five murders. His parents, 61-year-old Neville Bamber and his wife June, who was also 61, his 28-year-old sister, Sheila Caffell, and her twin boys, Daniel and Nicholas, who were only six. Jeremy Bamber remains in prison to this day and has always maintained his innocence. Actively working On numerous appeals and with a large number of supporters, he tries to prove that this terrible crime was not committed by him. He is serving one of the UK's few whole life terms, which means he will never be released. In this video, we travel to Tolshunt Darcy and the locations to see for ourselves the area nearly 40 years on. The scene at White House Farm that morning must have been truly horrific. In total, 25 shots were fired into five victims, all at close range. The murder weapon was a semi-automatic rifle belonging to Neville Bamba. The police were first alerted to the fact something was wrong at White House Farm when Jeremy Bamba, 24-year-old adopted son of Neville and June, contacted them at 3am, claiming his sister Sheila had gone crazy with a gun. He claimed that he'd received a distressing call from his father, Neville, telling him that his sister had gone berserk and that she had a gun. The line had then gone dead. Jeremy claimed he'd also heard a shot fired. He referred to his sister as a nutter in reference to her recent diagnosis of schizophrenia. The police accompanied Jeremy to White House Farm where they decided on how best to enter the property unsure if the shooter was still active. They finally entered the house by breaking in the door with a sledgehammer at 7.54am. The door had been locked from the inside and the key was still in the lock. Neville was found in the kitchen, the only victim to be found downstairs. There were signs of a struggle. A chair was overturned next to the fireplace. The phone was off the hook in the kitchen. Police concluded that Neville had first been shot upstairs and had made his way down to the kitchen. He was in his pyjamas and he had been shot eight times. There were bruises and lacerations to his head and neck, which showed that he had fought for his life. June Bamba's body was found by the door of the master bedroom. Police believe she'd been sitting up during part of the attack. She too was in her pyjamas and had been shot seven times. One shot was from a foot away. The twin boys, Daniel and Nicholas, were dead in their beds 
having been shot in the backs of their heads. Daniel had been shot five times and Nicholas three times. Both were killed at very close range, about a foot away. Sheila was found on the floor of the master bedroom near to the body of her mother. She too was dressed for bed, her feet were bare and she had two bullet wounds under her chin, one in her throat. The rifle was lying on her body, pointing up towards her neck. The sights, usually kept on the rifle due to being fiddly to remove and reattach, were not there, nor was the silencer. Three generations of one family, all dead. The only survivor, an apparently traumatised Jeremy Bamba, who was just 24 at the time. The press led with the stories of murder-suicide, the disturbed actions of a mentally unwell young woman who was in a deluded state and had murdered her parents and children before turning the gun on herself. There were certainly mistakes made early on, with police accepting the murder-suicide theory and not really pursuing other possibilities with any vigour. After all, the facts of Sheila's mental illness were there to be seen, and it wasn't a secret that her relationship with her mother was very strained. June Bamber was a very religious woman who had fixed beliefs about morality and had made comments about the powers of the devil that had become woven into the deluded thinking of Sheila when she was unwell. It had been said that June's extreme religious views were impacting not only Sheila, but the twins as well, who found visiting their grandparents difficult because of this. They were spending more and more time with their father, who was estranged from Sheila after he ended their relationship soon after they were married. Because of this steadfast belief that Sheila had finally snapped and gone on a murderous rampage that had also led to the ending of her own life, it was said that police conducted a poor investigation, not fully securing the crime scene, not recording or preserving evidence. For example, within days they had burned the bloodstained mattresses, bedding and carpets. This, ironically, was done so as to ease the distress of Jeremy Bamba. On top of that, the police removed the murder weapon without wearing gloves and it wasn't examined for fingerprints for over a week. Jeremy Bamba's behaviour began to raise suspicion with his cousins and other members of the family. The house was returned to the family soon after the murders, which spoke to the less than robust efforts of the police at the time to study the crime scene. Jeremy was spending money a lot, partying and going on holiday. He was the sole beneficiary of the family's estate. On August the 10th, three days after the crime, one of Jeremy's cousins found the silencer to the gun in a cupboard in the house. It had struck the family as odd that the silencer was not on the gun in the first place, as it always was. However, if the silencer had been on the gun, then it wouldn't have been possible for Sheila to shoot herself the barrel would have been far too long. In order for the murder-suicide theory to hold weight, the silencer would have to have not been attached. When the family examined the end of the silencer, they found that it contained red flecks of what seemed to be traces of both blood as well as paint. They contacted the police who took three days to collect it from them. The family also noticed a number of scratches on the red mantelpiece. It was their belief that the silencer had indeed been on the gun at the time of the murders and removed afterwards so as to support the theory that Sheila had been the killer and then shot herself. The family saw the scratches on the mantelpiece and the corresponding paint chips on the silencer as proof of a struggle at the time of the murders. At the funeral for his parents and sister, Jeremy's emotions appeared contrived. Many of us are familiar with his frozen expression of grief that was plastered all over the front pages of newspapers that appeared to show a young man overwhelmed by the loss of all that he held dear. However, at other times during the funeral, he was observed smiling and joking. Accompanying him was his girlfriend, Julie Mugford, who on occasions seemed to be holding him up. His emotions were erratic and changeable. Not long after the funeral, Bamba and Mugford jetted off to Amsterdam, where he spent a lot of money on cannabis. 
he quickly began to try to sell items belonging to his family, such as his parents' cars. He even tried to sell nude modelling photos of his sister for £20,000 to the Sun newspaper. It was Julie Mugford that began the unravelling of Bamber. She had initially been in support of him, telling police that he had called her between 3 and 3.30 on the morning of August 7th, saying that he was worried that something was wrong at the farm. She hadn't really paid much attention, she said, as she'd been sleepy and tired. Mugford's support and belief in Bamba began to change due to his detached and emotionless behaviour and was also very much fuelled by his callous treatment of her. She soon learned that he'd been seeing other women behind her back. They argued a lot and at one point she is alleged to have called him a psychopath. When Julie Mugford provided police with a second statement on the 7th of September, it was very different from her first. She told them that Bamba had already talked about killing his family, saying he wished he could get rid of them all, that he didn't like the way they were trying to run his life. She claimed his comments also extended to his sister and her children, that he had said she had nothing to live for and that the twins were disturbed. He had even voiced how Sheila would be very easy to blame for things. She hadn't taken the comments seriously at the time, and it does beg the question why she waited a month to come forward. More damning comments from Mugford contained Bamba's plans for how he would carry out the murders. According to Mugford, he had said he could cycle to the farm using the back roads, enter the house through the kitchen door because he knew that the latch was broken and that he could leave via a window that was able to be latched from the outside. According to Mugford, he even spoke about making a call from White House Farm to his home because he knew that it would be recorded. Apparently, Bamba had also claimed to test his resolve for murder by killing rats with his bare hands. Mugford's statement went on to say that on the evening of August the 6th, Bamba had talked about it being now or never. She had noticed that Bamba had his mother's bike at his home and that he'd spoken about using a bike to go to the farm so that he would go unnoticed and his car wouldn't be spotted out and about by others. She claimed that after the murders, Bamba had commented to her that he should have been an actor. Mugford's statement concluded that Bamba had paid a friend £2,000 to carry out the murders and that things had been difficult when Neville had put up a fight. That was why he had been shot so many times. Mugford claimed that Bamba had confided that the friend had told Sheila to lie down and shoot herself last. Mugford did have some history associated with dishonesty, such as using a stolen checkbook, and she'd also helped Bamba to steal a £1,000 from his parents' caravan site business. Bamba and his friend were arrested the next day but the friend wasn't charged. He had a solid alibi. Bamba maintained that Mugford's statements were the words of a woman scorned. And, contrary to the claims of his cousins, Bamba said that the silencer of the gun was usually kept off because it prevented the gun from fitting into its case. He also explained that he only broke into the caravan site to demonstrate to his parents that security was poor. Bamba was charged for the caravan site break-in and then released on bail. He wasted no time in going on holiday once more to Saint-Tropez. On his return, Bamba was arrested at the airport and charged with all five murders. It was September the 29th, just short of two months after the horrific events at White House Farm. Bamba's trial began on October the 3rd, 1986 and lasted for 18 days. He was described by the press as being arrogant in his conduct. The prosecution's case was that he was motivated purely by greed and hatred and resentment of his family. That he had carefully planned this attack, using his mother's bicycle to be less visible and using his knowledge of the house to gain entry and exit without signs of a break-in. It was purported that he orchestrated the scene to lay the blame on his sister, taking advantage of her well-known mental health issues. 
Bamba then staged the phone call from the kitchen to his home and left the receiver off the hook. He had cycled back to his house in Goldhanger and at around 3am he had called Julie Mugford. The prosecution continued to poke holes in Bamba's version of events. They claimed that blood on the silencer that had been removed after the killings belonged to Sheila and proved that she could not have shot herself. They asserted that Bamba had never received the call from his father implicating Sheila, that this was a lie and part of his plan to scapegoat his sister and absolve himself of any blame. The prosecution also assert that the injuries to Neville's throat showed he would not have been able to talk and there was no blood on the phone, despite the crime scene being extremely bloody. It also would make no sense for Neville to phone his son rather than call the police. The prosecution also asserted that Sheila would not have had the strength to overpower Neville in a struggle and that she'd not been voicing any suicidal thoughts at that time. Evidence also shows that though her relationship with her mother was strained, this was not the case with her father. It was also considered highly unlikely that she would ever have hurt her children. Further to this, she had no real knowledge or interest in guns and there was no evidence on her hands, clothes or body that she had used a gun or been involved in any type of struggle. According to the defence, any witnesses who had described Bamba talking about his hatred of his family were lying or they'd simply got things wrong. Julie Mugford's statements were fuelled by him having cheated on her. No one had witnessed Bamba cycling to the farm, so this was conjecture. There were no marks on him to suggest that he'd been involved in a struggle. No one had ever recovered blood-stained clothes that belonged to him. They claimed that Bamba regularly used the window to access the farmhouse, so finding evidence of this now was inconsequential. Their case rested on Sheila being responsible. They asserted that she was familiar with guns as she'd been raised on a farm and that she was mentally unwell and often in the grip of dangerous delusions. They also cited a recent family argument where putting her twins into foster care had been discussed. They had an expert claim that it wasn't uncommon for mentally disturbed individuals responsible for these types of killings to sometimes engage in ritualistic behaviour. In that, before killing herself, Sheila could have washed her hands and changed her clothes, removed the silencer and putting it neatly away in the cupboard. That the blood, on its end, might not even have been hers, but a mixture of Neville and June's. The judge saw the case hinging on three points. Who were we to believe? Mugford or Bamba? Was the shot that killed Sheila fired with the silencer on or off? Did Neville call Jeremy Bamber in the middle of the night? After nine hours of deliberation, Bamber was found guilty by a 10 to 2 majority. He was sentenced to five life terms with a minimum sentence of 25 years. This was changed to a whole life term in 1994. Jeremy Bamba has appealed his conviction in 1989, 1994 and 2002, all unsuccessfully. The case was passed to the Criminal Case Review Commission in 1997, whose purpose it was to review any potential miscarriages of justice. Advances in DNA in 2001 found traces of Sheila's blood inside the silencer. This strengthens the case against Bamba and showed that Sheila would have been unable to shoot herself with the extended barrel and obviously wouldn't have been able to remove the silencer and put it away. Jeremy Bamba lists 16 grounds for appeal and makes much of the sloppy police work. There is also a lot of complicated back and forth regarding blood on the silencer. As would be expected from a multiple shooting, there was blood from more than one of the victims present. The judge concluded that Bamba's conviction was not unsafe. Bamba continues to maintain his innocence and has also unsuccessfully appealed against his whole life term, having already spent more than half of his life in prison.
The campaign to prove Jeremy Bamber's innocence continues to this day. What is clear is the complexities of this case and the points of contention in both the prosecution and the defence. This case is certainly polarising and the arguments for and against continue to the present. We're now entering Tolshunt Darcy, the nearest village to White House Farm. On the right, we pass St Nicholas Church, where Neville and June Bamber's ashes are buried. It's a small village with large houses and pretty cottages. We know that St Nicholas Infant School is on our right and that Jeremy Bamber once attended. It's clear that this is a quiet, well-to-do area and it adds credence to the image of a bored, frustrated Bamber who might have felt constrained and restricted by farm life. There was a wedding taking place at St Nicholas Church when we drove past and there was a huge tractor outside for a wedding car. Farming is clearly ingrained here to the present. Once out of the village, it's only a few minutes drive to White House Farm. The area is now farmland at either side of us. We approach the top of the private road and pull in. A simple sign lets us know that we've arrived at White House Farm. The house is on the right of huge hedges and completely obscured. No passers-by can sneak a peek and no one can blame them for that. So here it is, tiny little stone. Actually walk right past it. Um, and this is the grave of Neville and June Bamber. Um, both aged 61 years, tragically taken from us, 7th of August 1985. Forever with the Lord. Such a small little stone, it was there. Uh, yeah, probably obscured by this plant. And uh, there, was a, there was a big service here that day. A really big service um, but uh, the children and and Sheila they're buried in London I believe in Highgate Cemetery that Neville and June came to this church um, this was their church they were involved with it and uh, they remembered very fondly here in the village. Oh, that's it. Rest in peace. <laughs>